name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome to this morning's worship at Manassas Presbyterian Church on this third Sunday of Easter. We are very glad that you are joining us this morning. I do want to remind you that these services are also recorded, so that, um, as well as live streamed. So if you know of someone who cannot participate at our usual time on Sunday morning, please let them know that they can still access the video at our website or our Facebook page. And please stay uh, posted as well to either our website or Facebook page for continuing updates and announcements. Let us now be together in one spirit as we worship God. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, the strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we who have not seen have faith to see your presence in the world and to hear your promises in the scriptures so that we may receive the fullness of Christ's blessing who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. We cannot come before God unless we are first honest with ourselves about who we are and the mistakes we make in our thoughts and words and actions and about how well or poorly we care for others. So trusting in God's mercy, let us ask for the forgiveness we need. Let us pray together. Have mercy on us, O God. Bring new life where we are worn and tired. New love where we have turned hard-hearted. Forgiveness where we feel hurt and have hurt others. And the joy and freedom of the Holy Spirit where we are prisoners of ourselves. We ask in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. 
Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. So believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Amen. I hope the children of the church are with you this morning because I have something that I would like to share uh, with the children, but also really the whole family. This is a book that is in our church library. It's called In God's Name by Sandy Eisenberg Sasso. And I think we've shared some of her books before. So I hope you will enjoy this one. In God's name. After God created the world, all living things on earth were given a name. The plants and the trees, the animals and the fish, and each person, young and old, had a special name. But no one knew the name for God. So each person searched for God's name. The farmer whose skin was dark, like the rich brown earth from which all things grew, called God source of life. The girl whose skin was as golden as the sun that turned night into day, called God creator of light. The man who tended sheep in the valley called God shepherd. The tired soldier who fought too many wars called God maker of peace. The artist who carved figures from the earth's hard stone called God my rock. Sometimes, the people who called God by different names were puzzled. They said every living thing has a single name, the marigold, pansy, and lily, the oak tree, sequoia, and pine. God must have a single name that is greater and more wonderful than all other names. Each person thought his name for God was the greatest. Each person thought her name for God was the very best. The farmer who called God source of life said, this is the true name for God. The girl who got called God creator of light said, this is the most splendid name for God. The shepherd, soldier, and artist believed they each had the perfect name for God. But no one listened, least of all, God. And so each person kept searching for God's name. The nurse who cared for the sick called God healer. The slave who was freed from bondage called God redeemer. The grandfather, whose hair was white with the years, called God Ancient One. The grandmother, who was bent with age and sorrow, called God 
comforter. The young woman who nursed her newborn son called God mother. The young man who held the hand of his baby daughter called God father. And the child who was lonely called God friend. All the people called God by different names. They tried to tell one another that their name was the best, the only name for God, and that all other names were wrong. But no one listened, least of all, God. And so each person kept searching for God's name. Then one day, the person who called God Ancient One and the one who called God friend, and the one who called God mother, and the one who called God father, all the people who called God by a different name came together. They knelt by a lake that was clear and quiet like a mirror, God's mirror. Then each person who had a name for God looked at the others who had a different name. They looked into God's mirror and saw their own faces and the faces of all the others. And they called out their names for God, source of life, creator of light, shepherd, maker of peace, my rock, Healer, Redeemer, Ancient One, Comforter, Mother, Father, Friend, all at the same time. At that moment, the people knew that all the names for God were good, and no name was better than another. Then all at once, their voices came together and they called God one. Everyone listened, most of all, God. Let us pray. We know you, God, in so many ways. We have many names for you, and we will never understand all that you are but we know you love us and care for us. Help us to love you too. Amen. Our scripture lesson today is from Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 13. This is a story of one of the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. It takes place on Easter Sunday afternoon. Listen now for the word of our God. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, 
and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's now almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Some of the best-loved stories in the world are stories about journeys. Think of the Odyssey, the Canterbury Tales, Don Quixote, Huckleberry Finn, to name just a few. People on a road trip seem to be a natural subject for the storyteller's art. Well, Luke must have liked these kinds of stories, too, because he tells the story of Jesus and the early church as a travel story, a story of people on the move. In Luke, there are journeys within journeys, and everyone has a destination and a purpose. However, the journey toward Emmaus of the two sad disciples on Easter Sunday afternoon seems to have no purpose. Luke gives us no idea of what they're expecting to find in Emmaus. Even stranger, we have no idea where Emmaus was. A town of this name just doesn't exist on any known map. There are, about, there are three different towns about seven miles from Jerusalem that have been suggested as the location of this village, but there's no conclusive evidence to establish any of them. The two disciples are mysterious, too. Only one of them is named. And, like the village of Emmaus, he appears nowhere else in any of the Gospels. It's almost as if Emmaus is any town, and the unnamed disciple who walked with Cleopas could be any one of us. It's possible the two men were going to Emmaus just to get out of Jerusalem, to bury their sadness in some unfamiliar place, somewhere away from the pain and cruelty of city life. 
Wherever or whatever Emmaus is or was, it appears that these two disciples were running away. Perhaps in the way that anyone who thinks he has squandered his life on a dangerous, foolish experiment runs away to try to forget in a place where no one knows you. The two men are all wrapped up in their sorrow, talking and musing as they walk along the road to Emmaus. But now here is this stranger who joins up with them, and they spill out the whole sad story, the story of high hopes trampled to the ground by the savagery of men, the disgraceful death of the one they had followed and trusted, and then the weird story the women brought back from the tomb, a story they dismissed as an idle tale. Even when the stranger interprets their sad story for them, they are so blinded by pain and grief that they seem not to hear him. Luke doesn't tell us their reaction to Jesus' words, and Jesus doesn't press them for conversation or company. But hospitality demands that they not let this gentle stranger go walking off into the night without a meal, so they invite Jesus to stay and have dinner with them. And finally, when they're at the table with him, as they had been so many times before, and as he takes bread and breaks it, as he had done so many times before, they recognize him. There's a fleeting second of joy and amazement, and then he's gone, vanished from their sight. And now the purpose of this particular journey to an out-of-the-way place becomes clear. This is the beginning of the transformation of the disciples. These gloomy men who had trudged along with their eyes cast down, from now on would be people who had a completely different way of being in the world. The story of Emmaus is a story about the beginnings of the church the small band of disciples coming together again to meet the world in a whole new way. Now the world these disciples would return to after the dinner at Emmaus would still be the same world in spite of the resurrection. It would go on in its usual way with its treacheries and betrayals and its disregard for the truth but they would be different. And as they came together again, they would begin to form a new kind of community, a community that gathered around a table to share bread and wine and tell a story they would never get tired of telling. And every time they got together to taste the bread and drink the wine and tell the story, there Jesus would be with them again a phenomenon so remarkable they couldn't keep it to themselves. And so all kinds of new journeys began, journeys to places whose names we do know, like Antioch and Athens, Corinth, Ephesus, places where sometimes they would be welcomed, but more often than not, they'd be ridiculed, dismissed, sometimes even beaten or thrown into prison. The world had not changed in any apparent way, but they had. Every time we come to the Lord's table together, we remember that Emmaus meal and so many others that Jesus shared with his disciples, where he showed his love for them through the simple acts of breaking the bread and passing the cup. These were meals of communion, full of the presence of God. When the very first Christians came together to worship, they remembered all the meals with Jesus in a symbolic meal they called the Eucharist. Eucharist means thanksgiving, 
And thanksgiving is the dominant note of this meal with the risen Christ. This sacrament is one of the marks of the church. One of the ways we know we are a church is that we do this. It's as intrinsic to who we are as the reading and interpretation of Scripture. But now, when we come together for worship, we must do so virtually. It is a great blessing that we are able to stream these worship services so that we can still gather, in a sense, from the safety of our homes. But we all know it is not the same. I can tell you that speaking to a camera in a sanctuary that is almost empty, except for those of us who are here to lead the worship, is not the same at all as speaking to you as a congregation, gathered in one place, physically present, embodied, and not virtual. Something is lost, and we all know it. And I think many of us feel that loss the most in not being able to come together at the Lord's table, where Jesus promises to meet us and transform us through our participation in this sacrament. Now, to address this situation, some churches are conducting online communion services. Many Baptist and independent evangelical congregations in particular seem to have readily adopted virtual communion, while Episcopalians, on the other hand, who emphasize the real presence of Christ in bread and wine consecrated by a priest, are tending to hold the line against a virtual sacrament. The Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, with whom we have a formula of agreement, is also discouraging online communion and recommending that churches use this time to study more deeply the meaning of communion. Well, Presbyterians seem to be somewhere in the middle. When churches across the country began to shut down in response to local advisories or statewide orders, the PCUSA sent out an advisory statement saying that we should not try to have virtual communion services. And then a couple of weeks later, our denomination reversed itself. The more recent advisory states that virtual communion can be practiced in the event of an emergency which would include a pandemic. To quote the document, during an emergency or a pandemic in which the church is unable or advised not to gather in person for reasons of public health, a congregation session may determine that this includes observing communion online. This should only be done, the opinion states, after thorough investigation of the theology of the Lord's Supper, using scripture, the confessions, and the Book of Order, and with a clear understanding of how those who participate at home will receive the sacrament as a means of God's grace. Well, certainly there are a number of things a session would have to consider before making a decision on something like this, but The most basic is our sacramental theology itself. We are not Roman Catholic, believing in the actual presence of Christ in the elements themselves once they've been consecrated by a priest. So we would seem to have more leeway in this matter. But we are not Baptists either, who tend to see the Lord's Supper more as a memorial of Jesus' last meal with his disciples and the presence of Christ as purely symbolic. We are in the tradition of John Calvin, who saw Christ with us not in the elements themselves, but at the meal, where he is spiritually present with the gathered community. This understanding makes a purely private consumption of the elements in our homes a little problematic. 
Christianity is an embodied faith, so physical things are important. The shared bread and cup, the physical presence of the congregation or its leaders. At the same time, the sacrament is a spiritual gift. So the characteristic words and actions of the sacrament, which can be spoken and carried out in a virtual service, could be seen as conveying the spiritual reality of the Lord's Supper, even if we are not together physically. So where does this leave us? The Book of Order stipulates that Presbyterian congregations should observe the Lord's Supper at least quarterly. Our last observance was on March 1st, the first Sunday of Lent. That means we should have communion again no later than the first Sunday of June. That's a long time to wait, especially since we're used to having communion at least once a month. If we get to June and we're still sheltering in place, which is quite possible, maybe likely, we may need to take virtual communion into consideration. Now, it has been argued that virtual communion will help restore a sense of normality. I understand and appreciate the de that desire, but there's nothing normal about the situation we're in now. And there's nothing normal about private communion in our living rooms. It may help to remember that the church has had to do without true Eucharistic practice in past times of danger and upheaval. The German theologian Michael Welker has described some of the bleak, depressing communion services he has attended, and one in particular stands out for him. He writes, I think back to services of Holy Communion in Berlin after World War II, in which people stood in long lines in somber big city churches to receive bread and wine. Here, one could not recognize Jesus' table fellowship. The scene had more the appearance of a business distributing scarce goods. His point is that many communion services, regardless of their form, do not convey gratitude, joy, or a communal sense of being with Christ. In its deepest sense, the Lord's Supper is a feast of the abundance and generosity and vitality of God. The question is whether we can recognize Jesus in the breaking of the bread, as those disciples did at Emmaus, in an online service where we are distant from each other. Jesus stayed just long enough with the two disciples to give them what they needed to know that he was alive and still with them and to travel back to the troubled world to carry out his ministry. Our own journeys have taken us in an inward direction over the last six weeks, but this is not the end of the journey. Let's let this be a time when we gather strength to travel back into the world God loves when the time is right, and then be ready to serve God's purposes there. There are still many more journeys for us to make. Amen.
now in thanksgiving to the God who has created us, who has redeemed us, who blesses and sustains our lives each day, let us offer our gifts and tithes for the work of God's kingdom. You may make your offering online or mail it to the church office. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Let us be in a time of prayer together. You have called us, O God, to care for your creation, to uphold one another, and to pray for your world. Hear the prayers we bring to you today 
for the healing of the earth and the healing of its people. We pray for all who are caught in the grip of disease, suffering, and death. And we give thanks for all who are bringing relief from the suffering under this pandemic. For doctors and nurses, medical support staff, drivers, first responders of all kinds, for scientists and researchers, for those who continue to offer needed goods and services to the people when it's hazardous to do so, and for those who see the needs of their neighbors and respond. May your blessing of peace and healing be on all of them. We pray for those who have lost their livelihoods or have been furloughed, for small business owners who are struggling, for children and youth who face uncertainty about the future, for parents who are struggling to hold families together in a time of hardship. We continue to pray for those in hospitals and nursing homes, and for all who feel lonely and afraid. We pray, as always, for those known to us who have ongoing medical concerns, who are anxious for a spouse or a child or a parent, for those who are nearing the end of earthly life, and those who are mourning the loss of a loved one. We pray for this congregation that your spirit of life will continue to hold us together even though we are physically apart. We ask you to empower us to minister to each other and wherever we're most needed in this community to bring friendship, comfort, and relief. We offer our prayers, O God, knowing that you are the God of transformations. You transform hearts and minds with the realization of your love and power in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And your spirit of renewal seeks everywhere to transform places of sorrow and suffering into places of healing and hope and new life. Hear us now as we pray in the words that Christ has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Will come with you. 
And now let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, the peace we are called to as one body. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you today and always. Amen.